What do you think about projected number one overall pick Victor Wembanyama? Any thoughts on Scoot Henderson or Brandon Miller at number two to the Charlotte Hornets? All right, here it is. Been getting comments for a while now. Drop a big board, Derek. Well, here you go. I hate big boards. I think for the most part, context is missing. We don't have the information that these NBA teams do in terms of vitals, personalities, work ethic, etc. So it can be a very ha-ha thing to look back on. It's kind of a trap for people to look back and say, oh, you had this person too low, you had this person too high, you're an idiot. And I hate that. Boards are, of course, made from a vacuum perspective, but that's not how it works. We can't account for certain fits or developmental paths because we don't know where these guys are going to end up. Some players are just going to land in better spots situationally for them, and that's just how it is. So with that being said, this is my personal board. It's not going to look anything close to the consensus. I don't think that's what boards are for. If I was adjusting my rankings based off of mock drafts from other experts or intel that I've gathered or read, I would be doing it wrong. At that point, I would just be making a mock draft. So this is based off my personal scouting reports, some draft philosophy, how projectable their role is, some ceiling and floor aspects intermingled, and more. It is divided up into tiers. Just know that it is very interchangeable within the tiers. You can do a lot of mixing and matching in that range. If I group them into a tier, I think they're pretty close as prospects. Obviously, the top-ranked prospect on my board is French phenom Victor Wembanyama. If you'd have seen another name pop up next to that little number one, I wouldn't have faulted you for stopping the video right then and there. He's 7'5", projects to be a high-level rim protector who can add a light-footed drop coverage wrinkle to his game down the line, and offensively he's going to be a juggernaut due to his size, but more so his skillfulness and fluidity in getting to his spots on the perimeter, coupled with a really clean shooting form. He's completely in a tier of his own, health permitting. I think we're genuinely looking at a perennial MVP contender and landscape-altering prospect. I think he's the greatest basketball prospect we've ever seen and he'd likely be number one on any board I make. Second overall is Scoot Henderson, again who's in a tier of his own due to his production in a professional league, elite level intangibles, and the competitive edge he plays with and would bring to a franchise. Simply put, I think Scoot has whatever it is. Using his S-tier athleticism, clean and projectable jump shooting, and general feel when manning the offense or defending on or off ball, I find it hard to envision a future where Scoot isn't a multi-time all-star and number one option on an NBA team. Notable drawbacks include his size, which I think is fine accounting for his 6'9 wingspan, and his outside shooting, which I think he's going to get to a respectable number. His obvious competition here is Brandon Miller, who most believe is jockeying with Scoot for number two and number three. My simple reasoning for having Scoot ahead is more consistently replicable offense and better creation tools. He's going to be able to create endless advantages via neatly packaged speed, first step, burst, and general athleticism. The third ranked prospect on my board is Alabama forward Brandon Miller, who is one of the best players in college basketball in his lone season with the Crimson Tide. I really value his length and shooting gravity, and from a floor perspective, I think he's going to be really valuable via those two things for the foreseeable future. Things that really boost his stock and elevate him to be the last player in a tier of his own include his handling and passing ability at 6'9". Like I said before, I can't quite get him to that scoot range. He's going to be just a little too reliant on ball screens or others to create shots for him for me to truly peg him as a bonafide star, but I do believe he's a surefire bet to be an exceptionally strong piece who at least exhibited star qualities in college, and there's not really a hard cap on what he can be if he can improve in a few areas. Alright, tier 4, and here's where things really start to open up. I have Arkansas guard Anthony Black as my 4th ranked prospect in this draft due to a multitude of projectable NBA skills, the first of which being his mixture of feel, basketball IQ, and decision making. A small peek into my personal draft philosophy, which is going to be highlighted by this entire board, I value stuff like this even more than raw athleticism and other tools at times. And Black has perfectly fine tools with moderate athleticism and length as a 6 foot 7 point guard. He's one of the best perimeter defenders in this class, one of the best passers in this class, is an above average positional rebounder, all of that alone is going to be impactful in the NBA, and that's without mentioning his scoring in which he exhibits fine touch, projectable slashing and cutting, pick and roll maneuvering, and an outside shot that I actually think has a decent chance at being league average. Give me AB as a high floor lead guard option who's going to be impactful in near every facet of the game. 
Extremely similar story with Cason Wallace here at number five. I think that Kentucky guard is outright the best perimeter defender in this class. He's not a particularly aggressive or creative passer, but still managed to average 4.3 assists per game with the Wildcats, which likely bests the rest of the lottery. And Wallace has a perfectly projectable offensive role somewhere between point and shooting guard. He's really good with the ball in his hands. He navigates screens well. He can generate paint touches at a fine rate and is a really, really underrated at rim finisher, one of the best in the entire class. He moves well off ball. The shooting numbers were not fantastic, but I really believe in the shot via some jump shooting he showcased here and there. Top five may seem pretty high to most here. In short, I think save for Wimby, he's maybe the safest selection in this draft. And his offensive capabilities are a lot higher than people think. He's lulling people to sleep in the sense that he's very unflashy, but he's going to be a phenomenal NBA player. I genuinely believe he can be a fringe star in the same way Drew Holiday is. Sixth, I have Kansas guard Grady Dick, who I think is one of the more projectable players in the entire draft due to his shooting gravity. I'm all about versatility regarding prospects, but I think Grady's upside in this department is simply too noteworthy. He's one of, if not the best shooting prospects I have ever scouted. He has impeccable form, loads of confidence, great shot versatility, he's got it all in this department. But there's more than meets the eye with Grady. He's an exceptionally smart basketball player, timely cutter, keeps offense flowing smoothly, and there's a lot of on-ball ability that wasn't tapped into via a pretty youth-restrictive Kansas system that he thrived in regardless. He's going to light it up from beyond the arc at the NBA level. But he also has these tools like fine handling, size at 6'8", and good finishing numbers that make me think he's actually going to come by half-court points a little easier than people think. Almost every knock I have, save for playmaking, stems from the defensive side of the ball, but there's also plenty of guys getting mocked in the top five that have defensive issues, and I think Grady is smart enough he'll be able to mitigate at least some of the concerns. I think he has genuine secondary star upside, or in the least will be able to shoulder the load for stars and really space teams out as a tertiary option one of the more unpopular slides on this entire board, so I'm first going to get into what I love about Amen Thompson before going over some of my issues. His athleticism, of course, is nearly unrivaled by prospects throughout eternity, not only due to his run and jump ability, but due to stuff like his contortionist style body control and more. On top of that, he's the best passer in this class, his tandem of velocity and accuracy is phenomenal, and while I think there's higher feel players, he's certainly fine in that area to the point I think he'll be good in the least. My primary hangups, of course, derive from his shooting. I'm extremely skeptical it gets to a work number. I do think it really hurts his case as it leaves him without a counter for how he's going to be defended though. I think without quality shooting and coming from a league I don't fully trust yet, Amen offers such specificity that it wasn't necessarily a drop for him as it was the guys I threw above him being more malleable in that sense. I sincerely hope he lands on a team that is willing to pour time and effort in developing him into a star and from what I've heard about his work ethic he earns points in my book based on that alone. Another potentially unpopular ranking here, Baylor combo guard Keontae George at number 8. George is a guy that has consistently fallen down mocks and boards as the offseason has progressed. I think there's been several flavors of the week that have kind of left Keontae as the odd man out, and I think that's completely disingenuous to what he did with a really good basketball team in the best conference in college basketball. Pre-injury, he was averaging nearly 17 points per game, improving even minutely in several key areas like passing, playmaking, defending. I think he's going to be a legitimate NBA scorer. While creation concerns have some merit, so much of that can be overblown. A few select players per team are asked to create at a consistent rate. And there's plenty of value in scorers outside of that, especially for a guy like Key who has tremendous shooting versatility. And even in terms of creation, he has advanced ball handling, is phenomenal in the pick and roll, and one of the more advanced shot makers at 19 years old that I've seen in a good while. Give me all of the Keontae George stock if others aren't buying it. Ninth overall, I have Azar Thompson, who I think is going to be a really solid, connective, wingy style piece in the modern NBA. He's 6'7 with a 7 foot wingspan. I adore his hounding defense and motor. He has high value passing skills and elite athleticism to tie everything together neatly. He's extremely toolsy, and from what I've heard, a hard worker with a chip on his shoulder, all great things. I buy the shot much more with Azar. I actually don't think he's too terrible a shooting prospect. If it was mechanically more sound, he'd probably be four spots higher on this board easily. Again, his slipping here isn't necessarily his fault. I worry about what kind of usage he's going to be capable of at the next level, how vital his early years in the NBA are going to be to his long-term success. If he's not a high-level creator, how elite are his off-ball skills? Similarly to his brother, it's just one too many questions, and yet Azar is still talented enough for me to take him ninth out of all the other ball players his age in the world. I think he's a high-level talent, and I hope I eat my words on these Thompson Twin rankings. 
10th, we have Houston forward Jarris Walker, who's a guy I've been a little more steady on throughout the cycle. His staunch defense and passing chops for his size have stood out to me even from his IMG days, and I think in anchoring one of the best defensive teams in the country as a freshman, he really lived up to the preseason standards I set for him. I do have real concerns about his scoring ability, namely what his actual forte is going to be. His finishing and shooting are going to have to get better, but I see real upside in his connective attributes, and I think his off-the-dribble scoring that wasn't showcased with the Cougars is very real. Even if Jarris never hits his ceiling, I think he's a totally worthy top 10 selection based off defense alone, which is some of the best in the whole class. I think he has real all defensive upside. At number 11, we have Taylor Hendricks, versatile 6'9 forward out of UCF who was a surprise one and done. Hendricks' defense and shooting gravity are the real selling points here. Near 40% shooting on 5.5 attempts per game, and some of the best secondary rim protection in the class. I think down the line he also functions well at the point of attack and can add other smaller wrinkles to his offensive game. He's just a tad too niche for me to consider him much higher than this. But those are really impactful skills, and especially as we're nearing the point where I think more quality starters and high-level role players should start to blur into these selections. Another potentially divisive ranking, I have Villanova wing Cam Whitmore ranked 12th overall, pretty low relative to the consensus, and likely where he'll actually be drafted, which I anticipate to be somewhere in the top 7. Firstly, Whitmore grew on me massively throughout the course of this cycle. One of the most athletic players in this class, and functionally so, he had an unfortunate preseason thumb injury and surgery, and still managed to get his name back into the top 10, and potentially even the top 5. I love his scoring upside, I think he's actually going to be a good NBA shooter, totally by the 3 point shot, and I think deep Defensively, he's going to remain a decent playmaker without adding any crazy impact in that area. In terms of weaknesses, I think his passing and playmaking is really hard for me to look past. 42 turnovers to 19 assists at Villanova as a guy who's going to reach his high-end outcome with the ball in his hands is kind of a red flag for me. Again, I love Whitmore as a potential tertiary scorer and creator, and I like him as a draft pick in general. He does seem like a really smart player who's well aware of his shortcomings and is willing to improve on those. I just think drafting him as a number one or two option is going to be asking a lot. In a similar vein, I have Ohio State's Bryce Sensabaugh, who honestly I've had a heck of a time evaluating, but I finally landed on being fine with his woes with the level of offensive production he's going to give. Plain and simple, I see no universe where he doesn't end up a top 5, maybe even top 3 scorer in this class, situation allowing. He's that talented. He's elite in isolation, a threat on the perimeter as a catch and shoot guy, and has the physicality to stand out in the NBA off the jump. Questions lie, well, everywhere else. Defense, passing, roll, and I get all of the arguments, but again, there's just times when certain production for me can outshine negatives, and this is one of those times. Typically, I shy away from score-only players, but at 6'6", six six, I could really see a pathway where Sensabaugh could make minor improvements in a few key areas and come away a net positive player. This is really a spot where intel on how hard a worker he is, or if I had a specific roster to associate him with, would make all of the difference. It could mean the difference between me moving him a few spots higher or dropping him into the 20s, but from a purely talent perspective, I like what I've seen. My last spot in the lottery is reserved for G League Ignite hybrid Leonard Miller, a player I think will be extremely productive in the pros, similarly to his time in the G. 6 foot 10 with a 7 foot plus wingspan, Miller is big man size with a wing oriented game and guard like skills. Suffice to say, he's very unorthodox, and his primary knock is that he lacks real traditional 5-man tendencies on both sides of the ball. I guess I don't personally see the issue with having a 6'10 rim rocker who can take bigs off the dribble and provide high intensity on the defensive end while retaining things like rebounding, 11 per game with the Ignite. Especially since he's still a teenager, and adding big man tendencies has to be one of the easiest things to do in the game. If he can continue to make threes despite his wonky shot form, I love Miller as a starting caliber piece down the line. All right, with the lottery over, I'm going to go just a little quicker through these. 15th is Duke forward Derek Whitehead, who, health permitting, should see a return to form in the NBA that I think will have him looking like a different player altogether. Whitehead's low-end outcome to me is still a solidly built floor-stretching forward with some defensive tools. His high end is a powerful athlete with secondary creation and real scoring potential with the ball in his hands. This feels like a safe middle ground between where Derek's range falls for me. 16th, I have Jalen Hood-Shafino out of Indiana, who surprised as a one-and-done in taking over important responsibilities for the Hoosiers last season. The quick hitters on what makes him a near-lottery talent for me are size at 6'6", six six, 
his ability to function extremely well in the pick and roll as both a scorer and passer, and his two-way impact. With those things alone, I think he can find some sort of role in the league. I do worry about his finishing, although his numbers saw a boost without TJD on the floor, and his scoring came in these weird waves, I think efficiency would have bumped him a few points on my end. It's a similar story here at number 17 with Kobe Bufkin. I have him and Hood Shifino neck and neck as jumbo point guards, albeit with vastly different styles. Bufkin's sophomore Michigan productivity earns him a ton of points here. He filled up the stat sheet in a variety of areas, was efficient, and obviously cared about the defensive end of the court. The only thing up in the air for me regarding Bufkin is his role at the next level. I think starting point guard is a bit of a stretch. I really would have liked his assist numbers to be better, especially with such a talented Michigan team. And while he's certainly serviceable off ball, he definitely is not at his best or elite in that regard. Just 36% on 3.7 three-point attempts per game. Maybe there's a team that can offer Bufkin developmental lead guard reps early, but otherwise he slips just a little bit here for me. I've got Wimanyama's Mets 92 teammate Bilal Koulibaly ranked 18th on my board. I love his measurables, 6'8 with a 7'2 wingspan, his defensive effort and versatility at the point of attack, and his athleticism does just enough for me to project him in the least as a solid impact role player. And he flashed really intriguing secondary creation and passing skills. I haven't quite gotten to the point others have just yet. He's been a huge riser in the basketball hemisphere of late, and I can't ignore his white hot LMB Pro A postseason run, but it's just too little too late for me to truly consider him over a chunk of lottery grades. The handle is a bit shaky. I think his decision making is going to have to really ramp up to break through roles in the NBA, but if a team is enamored with him, I totally get it. Take your shot, swing for the fences. At number 19, we have Michigan forward Jet Howard, who I considered putting a little higher due to having a relatively middle ground floor as a 6'8 floor spacer and creator upside in putting the ball on the floor. I do think he's a talented shooter who's going to carve out a nice role for himself in the least. He even had a positive assist to turnover ratio, which is more than I can say for a few other talented scorers in this range, but ultimately overall impact and defensive concerns landed him around this area. Just 2 assists per game and 2.8 rebounds per game coupled with relatively poor defensive acumen found him here. The last in this trio of potential creators is Maxwell Lewis of Pepperdine rounding out my top 20. I've been on the Lewis roller coaster all season. I was immensely high on him early as a do-it-all forward with great measurables, but some conference play duds kind of landed him on my radar for all the wrong reasons. At the end of the day though, it's hard to ignore what he is and could be. 6'7 with a 7 foot wingspan, solid spot up shooter, very good defender, great athleticism and a ton of scoring variants. I think he's a completely worthy top 20 pick in this draft. My top projected strictly role player in this draft, Jordan Hawkins, most simply has claimed to being the best shooter in this draft and offers some of the best movement shooting I've ever seen. He's going to make a day one impact as a three point threat, flying around off ball screens and lining himself up with a quickness. But his overall impact is a big question mark. He is on the lengthier side at six foot five and I think he has the makings of a potentially sound point of attack defender, but he isn't likely to add much in the ways of passing, rebounding and other high impact areas. So it's hard for me to justify putting him over some truly multifaceted prospects. 22nd overall, I have Xavier hybrid Colby Jones, one of my favorite prospects in this draft and a guy who I think is going to have a long, successful career helping teams do all the little things. He's a solid driver and slasher. He's got really nice touch on all the fun in-between stuff and has the handle to match. He can rebound, pass, he's going to defend at a moderately high level. Questions lie within his pull-up and spot-up shooting. He shot 38% beyond the arc on three attempts and just 65% from the line, but I really think he's going to have respectable outside shooting and hopefully that free throw number comes around. Love Colby Jones as a connective role player. 23rd, I have Arkansas wing Jordan Walsh. This is likely quite a bit higher than consensus. I think to this point, he's probably an early to mid second rounder. In the same way Sensabaugh's offense sends a jolt of electricity through my scouting spidey senses, so does Walsh's defense. He's six foot six with a seven foot three wingspan, and I see no future where he's not able to hound opponents at the point of attack, clog passing lanes, and generate points on that end via steals and blocks. I think he is elite. The primary issue being he didn't completely live up to the hype at Arkansas that stems from his offense, 7.1 points per game, 28% from three on low volume. He might never be a highly impactful guy on that end, but his defense is good enough I'm willing to take a shot on the scoring coming around. 24th, I have Duke's Derek Lively, who just three days out from the 2023 NBA draft, I'm still completely on the fence about. He 
He's going to be an elite rim protector. He fouls just a tad too much for my liking, but he's a decent enough tracker of the ball, has good timing, he's got the goods in the paint. I get hung up on the offensive ability, and I think I question his potential in drop coverage a tad more than others. Open gym shooting videos don't do much for me. The 15% from three at Duke stands out, but even then, I don't know if he's going to need offensive wrinkles if his defense is that good. I could move him five spots higher or five spots lower. In the least, I like him as a rim runner, shot blocker that you can enhance lineups with. At number 25, I have Ryan Rupert of the New Zealand Breakers. The short and quick is that he's six foot six with a seven foot two wingspan. He has elite defensive potential and showed as much in the NBL. Offensively, he's got a little wiggle, but the numbers were really bad via an early wrist injury he suffered. I really believe in his feel for the game and potential secondary playmaking chops that shined through at times. I like him as a role player swing here in the mid 20s. First up in this bunch of low floor creators is the ever polarizing Gigi Jackson. If you're gonna take a shot on what I consider to be a low floor creator archetype, I'd start here. Six foot nine with phenomenal ball handling, fluid movement, a clean and projectable jumper. If you're looking for a big bodied creator, Gigi has every tool under the sun. There's a variety of reasons he's fallen this far and further for most others. Decision making, shot selection, potential immaturity issues being the youngest player in this class a 1 to 3 assist to turnover ratio, but there's a real chance GG could be the steal of the draft in the right developmental system. I think he'd be an easy lottery pick in 2024, and I can understand taking the shot higher. Number 27, I have Nick Smith Jr. out of Arkansas, probably one of the guys I'm truly lower on, but I can still get behind his blend of shot creation, shooting potential, and some supporting passing and playmaking. He didn't have a phenomenal year with the Razorbacks, but he suffered multiple knee injuries that obviously hampered his lateral movement, and he was one of the top prospects coming into the season, so the talent is there. He has phenomenal touch, and I buy his outlook as a shooter, but I don't trust his passing, playmaking, or defense, and I just don't think I can get myself to the star level potential that others see. But I think he's a good kid and hard worker that's going to be totally worthy of a first round selection. 28th, I have forward CD Sissoko, who was fairly productive in his season with the G League Ignite. I really like Sissoko. I'd love for him to be higher, but I don't think he has any singular skill that stands out above the rest, but rather a nice blend of athleticism, secondary creation, passing, feel, and potential defensive chops. If he can become a reliable spot-up shooter and clean up a few things on the defensive end, namely off-ball defense, I think he's going to be a very solid player in the league, and he's a guy I would indeed bet on. Santa Clara guard Brandon Pachemski is the 29th ranked prospect on the board. At 6'5", I think he has a great mix of shooting, creation, defensive versatility, and general feel for the game that's going to make him a pretty impactful role player for a long, long time. Potential hangups really start and end with his athleticism. There's concerns he's not going to be able to hold his own in that regard, but I think we've been trending towards non-athletes having success in the NBA for a while now. From what I've heard about his work ethic and mentality, I could see Pachemski far surpassing this ranking. And finally, rounding out my top 30 is Alabama forward Noah Clowney. I think Clowney would have done well to hang around the Crimson Tide another year, but he's one of the younger prospects in this class, he'll be 18 on draft night, and still offers a ton in the ways of defensive versatility at 6'10". At the moment, I don't buy his outside shooting, but in the absolute least, he'll be a high effort, rotational big that fits the modern NBA perfectly. I do not have time to get into my 30 through 40 guys, but I did want to note that I really, really like the value in this range. Chris Murray is going to be an impactful longtime NBA player. TJD, I think, has a role in the NBA as a playmaking big man. He could end up a starter if he can mitigate some of his risks. Strother and Hawkes are two of my favorite players in this draft, and two guys I think have long-term futures as really strong role players. And the rest of this group has potential as well. That's it. Hope you enjoyed. Always appreciate any feedback, discussion, criticism. And the publish date of this video is two days away from the 2023 NBA draft. I am ecstatic. I cannot wait. Thank you for following along here with me. I will see you on the other side with lots of upcoming NBA draft content after the draft. Oh, and last thing, if you are here from the future simply to look back at what I got wrong, get bent.